first time I participate and attend this meeting. I'm really enjoying it. I find it very interesting. Thank you so much. It's an honor to see you, to hear you. It's also an honor to see some of my heroes of uh, the academic work, uh, such as Professor Chris French, Professor Fiona Gabbard. Some of my own colleagues uh, are here as well. Um, so it's a big honor. Thank you. Um, well, what I will first share my slides, and then we then we can start, and hopefully everything works immediately. So the title of my slides and my presentation is the revival of the memory wars, the scientific nature of false and repressed memories. So let me start merely with some with a pessimistic tone, uh, because what I will present is certainly not good news. It's bad news. But I will certainly end with a more positive note, and you will see what the more positive note is. Uh, but I will start with some more negative stuff, some more pessimistic tone. And I will start with a distressing phone call. A distressing phone call that I received yesterday. I received a distressing phone call from a Dutch journalist. A Dutch journalist who was involved in a documentary on ritual satanic abuse. And Dr. Kevin Felstad already uh, spoke a little bit about this because there's a huge thing going on in the Netherlands, but also in other countries such as Germany, about uh, ritual abuse and whether there should be new official investigations into the phenomena of satanic ritual abuse. So I received a phone call from a journalist who made a documentary a while ago in which people claimed to have been ritually abused and um, with no nuance about this whatsoever and he called me he called me and i had to say it was a quite a tense meeting a tense phone call because um, what the journalist suggested is that i think all of the stuff that we have been doing is look basically nonsense and that we have to look at these claims more seriously and um, why do i say this is because it shows that this entire idea of claims of people who have been traumatized has come back is still a very important topic in legal cases for academics but also for journalists and um, it belongs to actually a very important part of my presentation about the revival of the memory wars um, and i try to explain to the journalists that i think a lot of more nuance should be given to this to this topic about satanic ritual abuse than he is doing at this moment but um, I think I didn't succeed in this, unfortunately, showing uh, the pessimistic tone that I will start with in this presentation. Well, before I start with more of the content of this presentation, I want to say that all of the work that I do is part of a psychological laboratory that is based in Leuven, KU Leuven University and Maastricht. It's called the Criminological and Experimental Legal Psychology Lab, or in short, CELL. Well, the name is really not important. We had to come up with some with a fancy name and we thought, well, how can we bridge psychology and law? Well, cell would be nice. Cell stands for prison cell, motor criminology, law type of um, uh, and, uh, association and, and brain cell, motor psychology part. And uh, what for me is very important is that I do not do this work alone. These are my lab members all people, researchers who do research in the area of legal psychology, who study psychological, um, uh, who study behavior and its importance for the, for the legal arena. These are all wonderful researchers and I want to, of course, uh, show them to you. And some of the stuff that I'm presenting today is, uh, for example, based on work that they are doing with me. So let's start with the, with the bad news. And I want to start with something that has been called a zombie idea. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this idea of a zombie idea. Uh, a zombie idea is uh, a view that has been thoroughly refuted by a mountain of empirical evidence, but nonetheless refuses to die, being continually re-eliminated by our deeply held beliefs. A zombie idea. We can call it in this pandemic a zombie idea because we're only zooming at this moment. But I mean, repressed memories, of course, is in my opinion, a zombie idea. 
and we see continuously um, in the news, but also personally, but also in the again academic field, examples of people who still strongly believe in the idea of repressed memories. Here is an example in which the issue of repression and recovered memories was again porn to the, the case of Harvey Weinstein, which of course many of you have heard about, in which he uh, called Elizabeth Loftus, uh, Professor Elizabeth Loftus, to provide testimony, expert testimony on the phenomenon of recovered memories. Of course, I guess many of you have seen also this, um, this article in the cut about the memory wars. Again, some um, new will fuel to this entire debate on the memory wars and whether traumatic experiences can be repressed. And of course, this is what I just said. Uh, two of these things are in Dutch, but what you see here on the top uh, is about the ritual abuse um, well, movement that we now see in the Netherlands. And the person at the right is Professor Peter van Koppen. And if you've never heard of him, it's a shame. No, it's not a shame, but he is a professor of legal psychology who has done a lot of work in the area uh, of recovered memories, repressed memories, and its relevance uh, in a Dutch court system. And at the left is the Minister of Justice. And why is this important? Because these are two newspaper articles about whether there is evidence for ritual abuse. And um, any time when such complaints are being made, they are being sent to a committee which is called the Netherlands Expert Committee for Equivocal Sexual Abuse Allegations, which you see at the left of this slide. I'm a member of this committee, and this committee is quite under attack at this moment. And for the simple reason, because people think that the scientists also in this committee, like me, including me, are biased, that we only see cases on false memories and that we are not neutral anymore, etc. And this is all part of this presentation about this revival of the memory wars. So in this talk, I will talk about this revival and I will provide some examples from the realm of false and repressed memories, showing that, yes, unfortunately, what uh, Dr. Kevin Felsett has already, already said, that uh, we've seen a lot of research being done in the 1990s. Um, and perhaps ma many of us, researchers, but also people in the field, have been thinking, well, because of all of this research, these legal cases, the debate on this will, would have passed away. Uh, but I think maybe already 10 years ago, I already saw some indications that this didn't was not, was not gone at all, it was not over. Perhaps it was underground, but sometimes I just saw it in, in, in scientific papers. And I, I already told my dear colleague, Professor Harald Merkelbach, a professor of psychology and law as well, about this. Uh, and I said, well, are we perhaps a little bit um, naive, thinking that with writing some papers, this will just pass away? Should we pay some more attention? And for the, the next upcoming years, I've been collecting a lot of evidence showing that indeed the memory wars are not gone and sometimes even seem to increase. But again, there is some good news at the end, which I will show you. Uh, well, you all know, of course, the memory wars, which is this big debate about the existence of repressed memories. And we have seen a lot of cases on repressed memories, uh, also cases of daycare abuse cases, which false memories were very important. And um, you don't have to read all of the slides. Most of this I will certainly say. But of course, what is important to know that um, often what you see in the literature that you have about two sides, a side of um, clinicians, for example, who assume that psychological trauma can lead to some sort of unconscious blockage, unconscious repression of autobiographical memories, while you have many other often memory researchers claiming that psychological trauma is actually well remembered and that suggesting the existence of repressed memories can lead to false memories. So how will I show you that there is this revival of memory wars? I will do that uh, using four examples. One, one example is that there are attacks, recent attacks on false memory research. I will show you some research about uh, people believing in repressed memories and that this belief sometimes even seems to increase, is on the rise. I will show you that although perhaps the term repressed memory is not used that often anymore, you might say, there is another term that is being used highly frequently, which is the term dissociative amnesia, which is just basically the same as repressed memories. And I will show you some examples from uh, recent research in the area of therapy, uh, psychopathology, mental disorders, and the formation of false memories. 
So you all know well that uh, false memories refers to remembrance of a detail or an event that was not experienced. And just important for you to know is that we have often been focusing on cases in Western countries. But just to let you know, unfortunately, uh, we see these cases also in many other countries. For example, Indonesia. I, I, I mentioned this example for a couple of reasons. First of all, I am half Indonesian, so uh, almost every year I go to Indonesia to my family. Uh, apart from my uh, research and my, me being a scientist, I also have my own Indonesian martial arts school. Uh, th that's not that important, but it shows you that the Indonesian link is very important. So some years ago, I went uh, to Indonesia because I also do some research in that country on interviewing tactics that the police uses in Indonesia. And uh, I came across this case, which is a case in which this man behind bars, his name is Neil Bantaman, a Canadian teacher, was accused for abusing many children. So I, I looked into this case and uh, I gave a talk to people from the Indonesian police and I said, well, this is likely a false memory case because actually there are very good indications that the mothers of these children highly uh, provide a lot of suggestive questions to these children which likely resulted into false memories important to know that i think in this meeting now is also professor kamala london who was an expert witness in this case why do i say this because when i was talking about this case to the indonesian police i saw some people from the indonesian police talking to each other the entire time during the meeting so I know, based on Indonesian culture, that this is not respectful. If, if, if someone gives a talk, the, the idea is that you, you, you will not talk to your, the, to your colleague. So I already knew something was wrong, something was happening. So during the break, uh, some of them approached me and told me, well, Henry, you are talking about this, this case, which perhaps likely we also didn't interview these children in a very good manner. Well, this is a case in which we were involved as the Indonesian police, we interviewed these children and you're now telling us that we didn't do a good job. So I was a little bit um, afraid because if this would happen in the Netherlands, I would have to stop my presentation, I think, because I don't think I could continue this presentation because the, the Dutch police wouldn't like it that I would be so critical towards them. But actually, Indonesia, the contrary happened. They were, ve were very happy to hear this because they wanted to know more about how they should interview children, how they should interview victims in an open manner. Um, and this case um, has led to quite some media attention in Indonesia. Two years ago, I think, the Indonesian president provided clemency to Neil Bantelman. So uh, he's not exonerated, but the idea that he received clemency uh, does well, give some attention to this idea that this was a false memory case happening not in a Western country. Well, we all know that there are many ways in how we can evoke false memories. One of them is by using what the so-called implantation method, in which you tell people that they experienced an event in their childhood while this actually never happened to them. I'll just show you this example uh, that we in 2009 uh, succeeded in uh, making children believe that they were abducted by UFO when they were four years old, while well, that of course never happened to them. And I, I, I present this, this study also because my colleague, Professor Chris Fench is in this meeting and he might like this, uh, this story as well. And why did we chose this uh, example? For a simple reason, because we have seen these bizarre ritual abuse cases. And then the, the empirical question pops up, can you make people believe that something bizarre happened to them, which of course is completely not true. And we succeeded in doing that. So, uh, like I said, recently there have been some attacks on the entire false memory research. And these attacks have been focused on, I would say, two issues. The first one is uh, about the prevalence of false memory. So, how many, how, how easy is it to elicit false memories in, 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 for example, participants? And the other thing is about ecological validity. It's about whether the, the, the experiments that we do in the lab, whether they really reflect what happens in real cases. I want to show you this because this has been recently going on um, and I think it's, this is going on a little bit more than, let's say, for example, five to ten years ago. 
if we talk about prevalence, about uh, the amount of people who are susceptible to false memories, I think that one of the first people, first researchers who digged into this was Kimberly Wade and colleagues in this paper called A Picture is Worth a Thousand Lies, in which they used fake photographs to create uh, false memories. Well, I will not dig into the content of this experiment. The most important thing for today is this section of the paper in which they looked at previous false memory studies and then calculated uh, the mean percent of false memories and they estimated that this was about 30%. So this means that the participants who are involved in these experiments and experiments that about 30% of them would develop a false memory in these studies. So this is a percentage that was often used, also in court cases, but also in other papers. So this, this has been a very important number. However, some years ago, um, Chris Bruin and Bernice Andrews published this paper with the title Creating Memories for False Autobiographical Events in Childhoods, in which they provided a review of almost all studies uh, on false memory in this field. And they came to a completely different conclusion. They said that only in 15% are these experiences likely to be rated as full memories. Well, even if this number would be true, 15% um, is still a huge number in my opinion. Uh, um, and I will say something about this in the end of, um, of this issue, is that it doesn't really matter how big this percentage is. But what is more striking is that after this paper, uh, there was so much discussion about the paper that many memory researchers uh, wrote commentaries on these papers, including, for example, me, because um, we thought that there were a lot of unfounded issues in that paper that should be corrected. Uh, for example, we wrote a paper about that actually the potential for false memory was much bigger than what was suggested. We wrote another one that the paper dangerously neglected courtroom realities. And I will go on now very fast because you will see that a lot of commentaries were written and this is quite extraordinary that so many people were not really didn't really agree with that paper so here is one from alan scoboria rob nash catherine becker blees steve lindsay richard mcnally katie pesdek and it went on and on so a lot of commentaries showing that actually that paper from um, andrews and um Broome was an important paper, but certainly had some flaws. And based on that, um, some researchers some years ago, 2018, they um, did the following. They looked at many of these false memory studies again and looked at the stories that these participants gave and they recoded them. They used a new system to look at these stories, a system based on the most recent updates in the field of false memories, and then recoded them. What did they found? What did they find? They find that using this scheme, this new coding scheme, they found that 30.4% of cases were classified as false memories. Another 23 were classified as having accepted the event to some degree. And even more importantly, if the suggestion included self-relevant information, as something related to, their, to, their, to, to them as a person, an imagination procedure, the memory formation was even higher, almost 50%. So this is actually a study showing that this 15% um, that was seen in that uh, review by um, Bruin and Andrews was perhaps not the best estimate because many of the studies in this field have used different ways to look at stories that uh, the students often gave about their false experiences. And when just one coding system was used, you certainly come up with a much higher estimate of people forming false memories. Again, for me, it doesn't really matter how large this percentage is for the simple reason that, uh, in my opinion, and the research actually shows that, of course, we are all susceptible to, to, to such false memories. I mean, uh, our memory doesn't work like we already heard, like a video recorder or a filing cabinet It is reconstructive. So we are all susceptible to these false memories and we can all perhaps uh, develop such even implanted false memories. However, for these studies, it's important to know that depending on the conditions, about half of the participants in these studies formed false memories of autobiographical experiences. 
So there's, there have been some other recent attacks into the field um, on false memories, and these attacks were often centered about how well these studies that I just mentioned, how well do they reflect cases in the real world? And then they often talk about this issue of ecological validity, and I often use this definition from Uri Bronfenbrenner from quite a while ago, I think 1975-76, that stated that ecological validity refers to the extent to which the environment experienced by the subjects in, a, in scientific investigation has the properties that is supposed or assumed to have by the investigator. So why do I say this? I say this because, in my opinion, the studies that have been conducted, they possess the properties that we are interested in as investigators and that do map uh, to the legal cases that we see uh, and do also see as we are, when we are expert witnesses in these cases. So here are some examples of people criticizing the ecological validity. Uh, on the top, uh, also from Bruin um, and Andrews, they say, well, more problematic are memories for abuse, that is often the case, is repeated, sometimes with very great frequency. A challenge for the future will be to demonstrate that it is possible to implant memories of a repeated event. For the present, this should be noted as an important limitation. Or another paper uh, from Ruth Blizzard and Morgan Shaw with the title Lost in the Mall, a False Memory or False Defense. Or at the right, um, uh, Bruin Andrews caution that uh, false memory studies have not yet demonstrated uh, that it's possible to implant memories for events. Neither have researchers been able to implant memories for repeated events. So you see that there is some criticism on the studies that have been done on false memories. And recently I received this book with the title Eating Disorders and Child Sexual Abuse and I was startled with what was in it. Um, for example, here is a part of that book. However, the so-called false memory literature relies primarily on descriptions of anecdotal accounts from legal cases uh, and laboratory studies is not supported by systematic, empirical, and valid evidence. I'm not sure what they did read, but certainly not a lot of research in our area. But I will start starting about this, because again, this is about the ecological val the validity of the studies that have been done in this field. However, if you now look at what people have been doing uh, on, for example, uh, forming and implanting false memories, this is what we now find. We have seen that researchers have succeeded in implanting negative events that are sometimes shameful, painful, uh, uh, emotionally arousing, and these are the properties that we see in cases as well. Of course, in experiments, we cannot make people believe that they experience something highly traumatic like abuse, but we, of course, can come up with other experiences that do share the similar properties. Like, for example, Stephen Porter, who showed in 1999 that people can form false memories of bitten by a vicious dog, a painful experience. Julia Shaw showed in 2015 that people can, be, uh, uh, can falsely remember that they committed a crime, a negative story. Um, we found that uh, children could be uh, led to remember that they were accused of copying off someone else's neighbor. Uh, we succeeded in implanting a memory uh, of receiving a rectal enema, which is quite painful and shameful. A mousetrap uh, event that someone uh, had uh, their finger in a mousetrap or that they, that they had to go to a hospital. I would say these are negative events that share properties with the events that we often are interested in. And often this uh, nuance is not being given in the critique on false memory work. However, there was one critique that I think was important because these studies are all about implanting events that supposedly happened once. For example, that they were bitten by a vicious dog once. But like you all know, in many of these false memory cases, these, uh, the people remember experiences that happened to them repeatedly. So we have been interested in whether it is even possible to implant false memories that allegedly happened repeatedly to them. I can tell you we succeeded. This paper has been submitted, and this is the what we call a preprint with the title implanting false autobiographical memories for repeated events and the basic conclusion is yes we succeeded in doing that and it is just as easy and sometimes even easier than implanting false memories for a single episode 
this is important and we uh, uh, i think two days ago i looked at some new data with students and we in which we use uh, some sort of similar methodology in which we again try to implant false memories for repeated events and the story is the same yes it's possible to do so and as easy as implanting memories for something that happened supposedly only once so are the memory wars over one of the scholars paris in 2012 said that perhaps the memory wars are over i'm just presenting you now some evidence that alas it's not over at all and uh, I will do that in the following way. I will talk a little bit about uh, people believing in repressed memories, um, about the social amnesia, therapy, and about memory wars in the courtroom. So let's first start with people believing in false memories. So this is a table. Again, it's not that important, but just want to explain to you what this table contains. Of, contains. So from the 1990s, researchers have asked people such as clinical psychologists, um, students, people working in the legal arena, whether they believe in repressed memories. And this is a table containing all of these studies. And in that paper that you can see in the left that we published recently in 2019, we made a summary of all of these studies and looked at the percentage of people still believing in repressed memories, because these studies are still being done. Uh, this is a continuation of that table. Um, what did we find? We find that if you look at all of the studies, more than half, 58% of people agreed to the idea that repressed memories exist, that people can unconsciously block traumatic experiences. But more worrisome is the following. If you then only look at the survey studies asking clinical psychologists about their beliefs, we found that in the 1990s, this percentage was, was about 61%. But if you then look at the survey studies from 2010 and beyond, we see that this percentage has increased, not decreased. If you would expect that the memory wars would be over, you would expect that fewer people, persons, would believe uh, in the existence of repressed memories. But for clinical psychologists, this even seems to have increased which is worrisome because maybe some of them will talk to patients uh, who don't have any memory of sexual abuse and will then suggest that perhaps repressed memories might be real. Um, some researchers like Chris Bruin um, uh, commented on this paper and said, well, these studies are about conscious repressed memories. These are not about unconscious repressed memories. So we, we did some new studies uh, and we published this again with the title Belief in, in Unconscious Repressed Memory Persists, in which we asked people really the question, do you believe in unconscious repressed memories? We asked some follow-up statements, whether they, what they mean with this unconscious repressed memories. And the basic story is the same. People highly believe in this. So if people claim, well, this entire debate is over, then they should look at this. It's not over. People still highly believe in this. I say this also because I think maybe a couple of months ago, I talked to a Richard McNally, Professor Richard McNally, who has been a, a, an important key player of this, especially in the 1990s. And I talked to him about it because he was so amazed with this, because he also thought that this was not a big deal anymore. And then when he looked at all of these papers, he said, well, actually, yes, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that this is not over, unfortunately, and that we have to do something uh, with it. We have to bring more attention again to this issue, also because of the fact, uh, we think of the fact, that much of this is now going underground indeed. So let's go to the second one, second issue, is that even if people do not talk specifically about the term repressed memories, People often talk about something else, which is called dissociative amnesia, which is in the DSM-5, is being stated as a disorder, a mental disorder. Um, and Lawrence Batiris already noted this some years ago that when you look at the definition of dissociative amnesia, you can see it here at the left, it's actually the exact same definition as repressed memories. So people working in the clinical field and half the DSM-5 are trained in this, they are trained in the idea that dissociative amnesia exists, which bears many resemblance and similarities with repressed memories. Huh? The inability to recall autobiographical information, usually of traumatic nature, which is basically the same as repressed memories. And this is worrisome. This is worrisome 
and because people continuously also publish case studies on dissociative amnesia. So this is a paper that uh, uh, at the beginning of this meeting was alluded to by you, uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Felstad, a re recent paper that my colleagues and I, uh, Ivan Manjuli, who is a postdoc in Leuven, and I um, um, uh, wrote, which is a review of case studies on dissociative amnesia. So what, what is this paper about? So there are some researchers in the field who have seen people claiming uh, to have memory loss, and that often uh, this was memory loss of autobiographical experiences, and they published about these case studies, saying that many of these case studies are examples of dissociative amnesia. So we thought, you know what, let's look at all of these case studies and see whether these are indeed studies, case studies about dissociative amnesia. Well, the answer is no, they are not, but let's look a little bit in more detail. So um, we, we found 128 case studies and we examined whether they would meet the DSM-5 criteria for dissociative amnesia. Did they meet the criteria? Simple answer, no. They didn't meet the criteria, but they were published as if they did meet the criteria. The evidence for dissociative amnesia that was provided by the artists was very weak. Often alternative explanations, like that they fake their memory loss, was not even uh, ruled out. It was not even mentioned. While often in these case studies you could see that there would be external motivations why they would fake memory loss. What we also found very interesting is that often there was not even a traumatic origin, a traumatic stressor involved in the case studies. These were often, there were, for example, they had a, a dispute with their boss at work, and this was the reason for why they had memory loss for that experience. And this is also this uh, big um, uh, extension of what trauma is. Uh, so. Uh, just having an argument with your boss could already lead, according to the authors, to a dissociative amnesia, while there could be many other explanations for why they claimed memory loss. So in this paper we show that what we see in these case studies is certainly not good evidence of a memory loss due to psychological trauma. So let's go to the third point about um, um, that the memory wars are not over. And I want to uh, refer to this beautiful study that was done by Lawrence Patias and Mark Pendergrass in 2019, in which they surveyed more than 2,000 US citizens, and 217 of them stated that therapists discussed the possibility of repressed memories. And that 122 of this sample recovered memories even in therapy. And interestingly, there has been some replication work in this, for example, in France, Olivier Doge has found similar results uh, as well. And that you now know is that we are now doing and launching a European study at this moment in which we're including many different countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, Germany. We are going to do a, a European attempt to see whether we see this pattern also in other countries. Um, and to see indeed whether this idea that therapists still discuss the possibility of repressed memories is still well alive and buried into the clinical field. And I will certainly keep you updated about the results of this. There are some other um, 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 developments in the area of therapy and repressed memories. Uh, there are some very popular therapies, for example, in the Netherlands, but also in other countries. There is this very uh, popular therapy called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Technique. Very popular. If you look at the amount of publications in this area, this has exponentially increased since the 1990s. Uh, the, the idea of the technique is very simple. You have to retrieve your most autobiographical experience. And then, for example, the therapist will move with his or her index finger in your visual field. You have to move uh, your eyes. And research shows, there are some meta-analyses, some, some big studies showing that indeed when you do this eye movement, that the vividness, the emotionality of the experience decreases. However, the past years, my PhD student, Sanne Huber, who I think is also in this meeting as well, I, just, I saw her at the beginning, I'm not sure if she's here as well. We looked at first, does this technique sometimes increase the formation of false memory? That's the first thing. And two, what do these EMDR therapists believe uh, about the existence of repressed memories? 
So first of all, why did we examine whether EMDR plays a role in false memory? Because in that Dutch committee that I am involved in as well, we have seen the past years many cases in which people went to therapy, EMDR therapy, without any recollection of abuse, and then after EMDR therapy, suddenly had memories of abuse. So the question popped up, could it be that EMDR fueled the formation of false memories? And the second reason, of course, is that if you look into the, uh, the older literature from the 1990s, often a lot of attention was paid to st suggestive techniques that, uh, that were very suggestive, suggestive therapeutic techniques such as hypnosis, recovered memory therapies, but what we now see are that many of the techniques that are being used are at first sight not really suggestive. I mean, just moving with your finger, it's not, you're not suggesting that, uh, that you experience something, but it does do something with your memory. So Sanne Huber and we, we examined this and we indeed found that in certain occasions, this technique, the eye movement techniques, increases the formation of false memories. And second, we have shown that EMDR therapists even believe in the existence of repressed memory even more than their colleagues in other clinical fields. And this is important because they will talk with their patients about their memories. And if they highly believe in the existence of repressed memory, they could suggest to them that this indeed might have, uh, that, for example, abuse might have occurred to them. Another important thing relates to repressed memory and, uh, and therapy is this recent uh, paper that we published, a review paper in which we looked at people who already have some form of psychopathology, who are depressed, who, are, who have post-traumatic stress disorder. If, we, if you examine the studies that have been done in this area, we have found, this was a review, that these people sometimes on a certain condition are even more at risk to form false memories than people who do not have such a form, uh, such, such a disorder. So we have called this also the false memory, the dark false memory triad. If you enter therapy, you might enter therapy with a therapist highly believing in repressed memories. You might already have maybe a disorder which might make you even at risk for false memories. And, and there are certain techniques that might eel, even fuel the formation of false memories. And this is stuff that we, ha that we didn't know about, let's say, a couple of years ago, and there's increasingly more evidence and research in this area. Uh, and we're now looking at other techniques that are becoming very uh, popular, like imagery rescripting or cognitive reappraisal techniques that all do something with memory, that all edit memory. And we are examining whether this memory editing apart from the positive aspects, could also have some side effects. Eh? Because examining side effects of psychological treatment is a very ill-studied um, uh, topic in psychology, which is quite weird. I mean, we all know that there is so much attention now on side effects of vaccines. But do we ever talk about side effects of psychological therapies? Hardly. And if you look into the literature about whether psychological therapies have side effects, there's virtually no evidence about this. But it is highly needed in our field, and especially in the light of the revival of the memory wars. So this, uh, sh uh, this figure shows you about, um, shows you about uh, Dutch legal cases in which Terms like repression, recovered memory, or dissociative uh, um, amnesia was, was used. And if you then see, is I would say a worrisome picture, because if you then look at the years, you see that there is an increase of these terms being mentioned in these Dutch legal cases. Again, if you would expect that um, the memory wars would be over, you would not see an increase, maybe a stabilization, maybe even a drop, but you see an increase of these terms being used by other experts, by lawyers, people from the prosecution. Again, it shows that th this idea that uh, memories can be repressed hasn't died. It's still very much alive and enters our legal uh, arena. Another thing that we are seeing, and we are writing a paper on this at this moment, is about statutes of limitations. So uh, we see in many European countries that these statutes of limitations, or the period in which you can file a complaint, has been extended or even abolished in several European countries, sometimes even to accommodate for dissociative amnesia cases, which you see, for example, in France. And we are now looking on, in a European analysis at this moment again, the paper's almost finished, 
But we see that often uh, and sometimes these statutes of limitations were indeed extended in the legal arena to make sure that uh, repressed memory cases could go to court. Again, I have to acknowledge, of course, that if you look into the Me Too movement, uh, there is something to say that if something happened to you many, many years ago, that you should have your right to go to court, to go to the police, but again, there is a side effect towards this, and it is that there is a potentially uh, worrisome development that possibly uh, repressed memory cases are more easier to go to court than before. So, my, my, the last thing is some positive news. So, I've, I've, I've showed you some evidence and without going into too much depth uh, about um, um, uh, all of the studies. I've shown a little bit bad news that the memory wars, they, they are not over, they are not dead, have not decreased, seems that they even be, are on the rise. So what can we do against it? Well, in the beginning of this meeting, it was a little bit stated that, well, even if you tell people that their memories are, or that their beliefs are, are wrong, this doesn't help. However, we have some recent indication that if you give people correct knowledge about how memory works it does help this recent paper by my colleague melanie zarland and me in which we taught psychology students about the functioning of memory so what did we do these were psychology students who were involved in some courses about legal psychology such as courses on eyewitness memory etc before this course started we asked them questions such, just as, such as if they believed in the existence of repressed memories. And we found that many of them indeed believed in the existence of repressed memories. So then they were involved in this course, which we showed them a, a more critical view towards this. And at the end of that course, and also a follow-up meeting, often a half year later, even more than a year later, we uh, examined their belief in repressed memories and I, again, and the basic conclusion is that because of all of this um, attention to how memory works, significantly decrease their belief in repressed memories. You can see that here, um, the lower the score, the less likely they believe in repressed memories. Here you see, for example, a statement that we used, the mind is capable of unconsciously blocking out memories of traumatic events. At time one, if you look at the M, you see that uh, 3.27, which means that they highly believe in that. If you look at time two, this significantly dropped to 1.39. At time three, it's still lower than time one, often six months or 18 months after the first moment, showing, providing people with correct knowledge about how memory works does seem to work, not only, not only in the short run, but all seems to be even in the in the long run and this is perhaps something that we have to do more research on and see whether we can do more about this to educate people about the functioning of memory and the controversial aspects of repressed memories because because it does seem to help and it does seem to counter these wrong beliefs about repressed memories so yes one of the conclusions is you could say repressed memories are back, baby. This was one of the titles of a blog post uh, more than a year ago. But there is some good news. The good news is that you can debunk these myths, these beliefs, if you present people with the right knowledge. Uh, and, uh, but there are some other uh, uh, important questions that we do not have a definite answer from. Like, for example, where do these beliefs originate from? Why do people even believe in these beliefs? Uh, we don't know and we're uh, having some ideas which we will follow up the upcoming months and years. Uh, but certainly a basic conclusion is, and especially what we see in the Netherlands, is that it is so important in cases in which people claim memory loss is that memory experts are needed in such cases. And with this, I want to end my presentation. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Kevin Felsett, for inviting me. Uh, I hope um, the presentation was interesting for you. And of course, if there are any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm always open to respond and to answer. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Henry. It's a fascinating presentation. Um, have you got a few minutes to take questions? Because I may get lynched if I let you go without taking questions. <laughs> of course, um, of course, no problem, yeah, no problem. You, yeah, you got, you go got, ahead. You got through a lot. We must have a private conversation about martial arts, but that's another day. Um, I okay, great. Um, I've got um, one that's just coming on my mobile. Um, there's a few on the, the screen. 
I've been asked, can I ask you about what psychological disorders increase risk of false memories? So, yeah, so in, in, in the paper that we um, um, wrote, we reviewed uh, studies that examined um, certain disorders and false memory propensity, and, and these were studies including uh, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and people who had a history of, of, uh, um, of a traumatic experience. So these three. So we, we, there is no other research in this area, unfortunately. I recently, uh, I think maybe a couple of months ago, I saw a recent paper about uh, borderline personality disorder yes. and false memory propensity, uh, but that's almost all. Yeah. I, I was about to ask you about that, um, but, but um, that, that's interesting. Um, looking on the screen here, it would be Seb. Let's get this bottom one here. Gosh, you're popular, Henry. Um, <laughs> um, okay. I've been reading about the so-called multi-story model, which claims to show how incoming memories work their way through different stages before they become imprinted in us. Is this process subject to corruption along the way, and might this result in the creation of false memories? If so, how might this happen? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I've I've just included my email address in the chat for people who want to to email me afterwards, of course. But uh, uh, so uh, um, it's important to know that uh, whenever you form a memory, of course, there are three important stages: encoding, uh, storing the memory, and at a later part, retrieving the memory. And just to make it very simple, at every stage there's potential for contamination, for corruption, for the possibility of forming false memories. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's all. At, at every stage, there is a possibility that false memories can be formed. Some theories, even in the area of false memories, actually state that false memories only occur at encoding, while there are also others who state that they mainly happen at retrieval. But if you would look at them from a total view, you, you could say actually at all stages, there is potential that false memories can be formed. And you see, for example, a lot of attention being done now on a so-called memory phenomena called reconsolidation. That's actually something that you, that you see happening in many therapies. You have to uh, uh, retrieve a memory, then you do something with your memory, and then you store it again, as, which you, for example, see in imagery rescripting. Um, I hope that people have to uh, uh, imagine a more positive end that happened. Uh, and when you do that, there's, of course, potential for uh, memory distortion. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more, then I'm going to pull rank and ask one myself, Henry, a short one. Um, cool. there's, we've got one about EM, it should be EMDR. Um, is this EMDR therapy also used in recovering PTSD individuals? Well, I think you could probably answer that quite easily. Yeah, so, so yeah, EMDR is mainly used for PTSD, by the way, um, and um, if you look at the, into the most recent um, meta-analysis done by Pim Kuipos uh, and colleagues who looked at how effective is EMDR, it seems to be only effective for PTSD, perhaps, um, but it is being used for much more. It's being used for eating disorders, it's being used for uh, young children, even for babies. EMDR is being used at this moment. It's unbelievably uh, how extensive uh, this practice is being used. Yeah. I was interested in the example you gave about the person at work accusing a boss. Um, I've been reflecting on this a couple of years now, but it seems to me that some of the cases we get, initially the person may make an allegation, a complainant, for all sorts of reasons. It may be malicious. They may be looking for compensation, maybe looking for an explanation of what's gone wrong in their adult life. And then it may not be a false memory to start with, but later on, they may have come to, after more therapy, more running through it, talking about it, writing your dreams down, but they then come to genuinely believe and it turns into a false memory. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, I agree with it. And it touches upon something that um, Lawrence Patias uh, briefly alluded to, which is some recent research, certainly from him, is about this reappraisal of memories. So looking at your uh, earlier experience in a, a, a little bit different way, uh, because you, perhaps you have a motivation to look at it in a different way, yes. uh, maybe financial motivation or whatever the motivation is. Yeah, that's really good. Are we going to take one more set or should we give him a break? Um, what's that one? 
Okay, I'll give you a last one, Henry, then we will let you go. Yep. So, Henry's got other things on today. Important. No thing. problem, no problem. No, well, no, this, this, is also, this is very important. It was, this is my most important meeting today. Thank <laughs> you. That's kind. EMDR may be responsible for causing the development of repressed memory. Has this been challenged in court where people have been charged of historic abuse? I know you and I had a, a brief email about this, and we don't tend to get it coming up much in our legal system. Is, that, is it different elsewhere? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, for example, in the Netherlands, and I think this is just because also EMDR is so popular in the Netherlands. It's nice. really the number one treatment at uh -huh. this moment in the Netherlands. So, so if you if you uh, um, are, for example, a trauma survivor and you will go to uh, a treatment, you will most likely first get EMDR. So that that's of right. course that, that that that's a reason also. Um, I have to say that when we talk with people who are uh, in the EMDR committee. Many of them, of course, don't like this research um, that we do. Uh, but we, we also, I mean, this is also the balance that we want to make because we do see that there's a lot of evidence showing that indeed EMDR helps in making a memory less vivid, for example. But at the moment when people go to EMDR therapy and then go to court, there is a problem. Even if it has not affected false memories uh, uh, formation, but you can say that EM, you can say based on what we know that if people go to to EMDR therapy, that the reliability of their testimonies at a later point is effective, even if they their memories are less vivid, less emotional. So yeah. Well, brilliant, Henry. Thank you so much for an illuminating speech, which is quite brilliant in my opinion, and for taking those questions. Um, thank you for agreeing to be our keynote speaker. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Yeah.